Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Thank you for coming to this uh, second uh, ISR Distinguished Lecture of this semester. Uh, we are very honored and pleased to have with us today uh, Professor Joseph Spikis from uh, Weimar Graz University of Grenoble. Uh, Professor Spikis is a very distinguished computer scientist and engineer. He uh, is a director in uh, of, uh, in scientific director in Weimar. Uh, he was actually the director of Weimar for a number of years from uh, 1993 to 2006. This is a laboratory that he founded where many of uh, both theoretical and practical work on uh, what the technique came from. He has also been the scientific director of the artist uh, European Network of Excellence, and, and uh, also he was a founding member of the steering board of the Artemisia Industrial Association of Better Systems. Uh, he has received many awards. The most significant one is uh, he was co recipient of the 2007 ACF3 award with the uh, head clerk of uh, Carnegie University and Alan. I'm with the uh, University of Texas Austin for their pioneer work and starting of the field of modern techie. But in addition to modern techie, he has been a very founding and uh, innovator in starting the field of embedded systems in a more rigorous basis. He's a member of both the uh, French Academy of Science and the Academy of Engineering and the Academy of Europea. And he has many interests, which will take a long time to, uh, to decide. Uh, so today he uh, is going to talk to us about the vision for CS, the system perspective. Each person used uh, uh, 
about three, uh, two, 236 every day, and we see the distribution, the application area, the day we care about, uh, uh, hundreds of billions of embedded systems everywhere. And the problem is how to integrate the services that provide these embedded applications. So, systems are important, they have a tremendous economic and societal impact. And uh, the second of this, and uh, systems are instrumented, they are interconnected, they are intelligent. This is a this is a sort of my idea, by the way. And uh, you understand why in instrumentation you can sense and measure the state of almost everything. In the connection, different objects can communicate mm -hmm. in entirely new ways. And of course, intelligence, uh, this is also very important. OK, this is an outline of my talk. I will uh, explain why now the shift of interest in computer science to go from core programs to systems and talk about system design. Uh, I will discuss three grand challenges and I will finish with uh, a vision for computer science. Uh, I hope you understand the difference between I make between a program and a system. A program is a very simple system that is transformational. It takes input values and produces output values. You could a function. And uh, a program is terminating, it's usually deterministic, and when you are, are using a higher programming language, its behavior is platform independent. And we have a good theory to understand what programs do. And now, what is a system? A system is a, okay, a box here. It receives flows of inputs, produces flows of outputs, and we have this interaction with physical environment. And this makes all the difference. So in order to understand the behavior of a system, we have to study relations between streams of inputs uh, and streams of outputs. The behavior of the system is usually non-terminating, non-deterministic by its structure, and uh, this is very important, is uh, platform dependent. It means that in order to understand uh, the dynamics of this interaction, you have to know, for instance, the execution speed of this platform, and the characteristics of the physical environment. And I would like to say that we have no theory at all to build the systems, okay? We have theory to deal with programs as mathematical objects, but we have no theory at all to build systems. So there is an important difference here. At least we have nice theory and here just an idea. So system consists of hardware, software. Systems may interact with very complex environments. And the hot matters here is this loop, a real time control. Okay. And this is the important difference. And this slide I summarize again what I said. And uh, so in system design, you should take into account not only interaction between a system software and hardware, but also interaction with uh, the environment. So, what I mean by system design? System design is a process that leads to a mid mix, to a mixed, sorry, software hardware system from given requirements. So you have some requirements, and then you have an idea to change the course of the requirements to some implementation of your system, and this is a mixed system. Uh, a hardware platform may be given. And here you have two important steps. You go from requirements to a program, program is an executable uh, description that is platform independent usually. And then you have to get here, here you may have compilers or other tools, and this step cannot be automated. So you understand that this is different from pure software or hardware design. And uh, the challenge is how to formalize and understand this, this process, especially when the target platform here can be distributed uh, with uh, almost all theory for that. Okay, now a few words about uh, uh, system design. So, uh, 
I think that what happened with the advent of uh, uh, embedded technology said is that we have a break between a modern system design and traditional uh, system design. So there is a big difference in the way uh, embedded systems are designed and uh, the systems you have in uh, servers or in your lab. Why? Because uh, embedded systems should uh, jointly meet technical requirements as this. For instance, your uh, laptop may not respond within a non guaranteed delay to, to, to the execution of a, uh, of a command. This should not be the case for a flight controller. Also, for embedded systems, you have autonomy requirements, continuous autonomy, no manual start. So, if you have a system hidden I mean, in, in your car and you have a problem, you cannot uh, start it manually. But also, you should have, uh, this is very important for autonomy. So, if you have a mobile phone, the software is not developed as, as the software of your laptop. Because if it was developed as a software of your laptop, the autonomy would continue on your few hours. And of course, with the ability and other, other requirements, I'm not going to comment this. And in addition to that, you should take into account economic requirements because uh, embedded systems are mass market products and there is a lot of competition in the market. And it's clear that uh, the technological challenge is to be able to build systems of guaranteed functionality and quality at an acceptable cost. And we don't have today theory about how to do that, or uh, even elements of theory about how to do that. What's the state of the art today? Today we master at high cost two types of, of system technologies. What we call critical systems. They may be uh, safety or security critical systems of low complexity, what I mean systems of low complexity, a flight controller, or the most complex flight controller can be some hundreds of thousands of lines of code. Okay? Uh, and uh, you have, uh, so, this type of systems, and you have complex best of systems, like telecommunication systems. The difference is that for this type of system, you try to uh, have some reasonable level of availability, but you, you care mainly about uh, how to manage uh, resources, the available resources. So for tomorrow, we need uh, affordable critical systems, so uh, critical technology that is available at lower costs. Uh, for instance, uh, at least the European uh, car industry, they had a very ambitious project to use uh, drive-by-wire or break-by-wire technology by applying a paradigm that has been very successful uh, for aircraft. And uh, they gave up these projects just because uh, okay, you cannot have uh, this type of technology in everybody's car. That's a lot. Also, there are, there are very ambitious uh, applications uh, in, uh, systems in health. And uh, here there are, there are some, some, some obstacles, some, uh, I mean, we don't know how to make them either uh, reliable enough or, or cheap enough and other applications. The other challenge is how to integrate successfully systems of systems. Uh, so if you have uh, systems that have different characteristics, I have, uh, I don't know, I have uh, mobile phone systems and I have uh, some banking system or other type of system, they have different characteristics, how to make them cooperate to produce global services. Uh, this is uh, a non-trivial problem. Uh, there are many uh, uh, instances of this vision of systems of systems. I will mention the Internet of Things. We have probably about the Internet of Things that uh, is the result of the convergence of of uh, internet technologies and uh, embedded system technology. The idea is that today by clicking on the link, uh, you have access to multimedia documents. Tomorrow by clicking on the link, you have access to uh, 
uh, devices that are embedded devices, so uh, you have access, of course, today you can have access to a camera, but you can have a phone, but you can have access to uh, uh, embedded systems uh, in your enterprise, in your, uh, in your, in your office, or at home, or and you can, for instance, control distantly uh, uh, devices that, that, that you have. In order to achieve this, you should uh, have an uh, internet infrastructure that is uh, uh, more reliable, more secure, and more reactive. There are very important projects also on smart grids to, to care about that. How to use internet technology to uh, manage uh, power consumption at home. In the future, you will have many different providers, and the idea is to coordinate this consumption and for instance start with your washing machine when you have the rates will be the lowest when you take care of projects like that. I'm not going to give more details. Uh, now I think that embedded systems design that brings computer science closer to physics. And uh, I think that it's important to understand what are the differences between uh, disciplines based on physics and computer science. So in traditional systems engineering, uh, you have solid theory for building artifacts. This is a very well-known fact where you want to build a bridge, write down some uh, system of equations to solve them, and we have recipes about how the bridge of that will not collapse with very, very high probability for centuries. Okay? And this is not the case for computer science. Why? Because we don't have what I call constructivity results, or we have constructivity results for very simple systems. We have algorithms, we have architectures, but I don't, we don't have theory about how to combine all these results to build complex systems. And this is an important difference. We can discuss about that later in the more slides. So the important fact about systems engineering today is that when you build a complex, a large IT system, and this is a risky undertaking for what I call a large IT system, can be the design of, of a complex uh, chip, it can be the design of a web or platform, okay, depending on the application areas. And the difficulties, okay, here I give a list of difficulties. You have to reduce components, you don't have theories about how to reduce components. The requirements are often complete and ambiguous. Apply the requirements for a bridge because we understand perfectly well physics and what it means the resistance of, uh, of, of, of such construction uh, are, are can be very well defined. And then the design approaches are, 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 are empirical. And empirical, they are based on the expertise of teams, you know that. A complex system is built from simpler systems by, okay, by patches or by extending functionality, and, uh, and we don't, we do, we don't have very rigorous approaches. So, in my opinion, systems engineering today is in, at the same stage of development as, uh, say, mechanics in, in the Middle Ages. You uh, know probably how they bridges or cathedrals here in the pages. They will be fine, okay, by prior, prior and error process, they, 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 they will be the case. Okay, and uh, I think that today there is a problem, because uh, despite the progress we've been doing over uh, 70 decades, uh, and in theory, yes, we did, there is a, an increasing gap between the capabilities offered by technology. Uh, I, I've uh, talked already about uh, multi core systems. We have a lot of focus on automated communication and our know how in computer systems engineering. And this is uh, really a problem for computer science. Uh, I remember when I was already a student. This was an important debate within the research science community. People were regretting this gap between theory and practice, which is a unique, unique for computer science. And this is a text written by Christopher Strachik, who was the first professor uh, 
get a chair of programming at Oxford and in his inaugural lecture he wrote this text saying that I regret this, but at the time he was saying that he was very optimistic that uh, by uh, the work he will be doing in his group, that he will fill the gap. Okay, this gap will be filled. But today I am uh, not as optimistic as he used to be. So this is a danger, I think, of computer science as a discipline. Now, I see three grand challenges for computer science uh, in the area of systems. And these challenges are derived from the three facts, important facts about systems. So systems are instrumented, interconnected, and intelligent. So instrumented means that they continuously interact with uh, some environment, and we should be able to understand this interaction between the skilled computation and a continuous dynamic environment. The second is interconnection. So systems are built out of components that we interact and we need theory about how to build systems from, from components. And the third is intelligence. I don't like the term intelligent, intelligence or intelligent for systems because there's some connotation and I, I will talk about the activity. So we present very brief this three challenges. Okay. Many physicality and computation. I hope you understand what is the problem. A system, okay, so it has some software running on it. And then, of course, when you write a line of software, you should take into account the resources that you can make available, okay, in, in, in the platform. And uh, so, and also, of course, you have to interact with the environment, and the environment poses the lines. Throughput, the jitter, etc. So all the time constraints that come from the back. So if you want to be a good system designer, you should not only understand this, but you should understand the interaction between software and hardware. And of course, you should also uh, understand principles of, of control. Okay? And uh, this is very, very important for systems engineers. So this is my vision about uh, systems engineering today, we, of course, are taking a, 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 a perspective that is uh, from computer science. So I say that we need to revisit and revise computing and integrate the methods from the electrical engineering of control. Okay? And uh, this is something that, that, that we need for systems engineering. And to be more concrete, I'd like to say that today systems engineers have to deal with two types of models. Models that come from physical systems engineering and the models that come from computing systems engineering. Uh, so an example of these types of models are models where we describe the dynamics of a system as a set of uh, uh, linear uh, differential equations. And the system can be represented as a network of nodes. So here you have a, each node is characterized by a transfer function. And it, uh, its node transforms into flows into output flow. And the computation, so here the model, the connection is data flow and the composition is fully parallel. While uh, if you consider uh, models that are uh, 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 come from computing systems engineering, you will have the program as a sequence of function and function calls. Okay, let me be more concrete. And the problem is how to, to, to marry, how to combine this type of program. So you probably, I mean, these who come from electrical engineering, and they are probably cared about MATLAB Simulink, which is a very popular uh, tool to model uh, dynamical systems. So this is a, 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 a model of an ABS system. Uh, so each box is characterized by a transfer function. And uh, if you give uh, to the tool this model, you can generate code uh, that, that will uh, uh, implement the system. And perhaps you don't understand anything about programming. But, but it will work, or to some extent it will work. 
And the, the same GDS may use this type of model. And this type of model is, uh, so this is uh, a stray diagram of my UML uh, tool. So here the reason purely sequentially, you are in a state, it move to the next state. So when we program the reason sequentially, even though you can put the programs, but, but, but uh, programs is written here in the sequential. And the pro problem is how to combine these two types of, 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 of uh, tools or these two types of models. This is still an open problem. If you have solutions, you can discuss about that. The second current challenge is uh, what I call component-based design. Why we need the uh, components? Because in any engineering uh, discipline, we will use components. Uh, using components is a means to cope with complexity. And, uh, okay, you understand the principle. Uh, so you can consider that the module is the composition of simple components. The, simple co the simplest components are often some. Basic functionality, and then you build hierarchically uh, uh, complex systems by composing components. So, the important concept here is how you compose, how to make uh, uh, components interact. And uh, I would like to say that uh, in computer science, in contrast to what happens with other disciplines, for instance, if I am an electrical engineer, I will have to deal with a very limited number of types of, of components. While in computer science you have uh, there big confusion, we have uh, hardware description language, we have programming languages, we have middleware description languages, we have system description languages, uh, there is a, a big confusion. And uh, the question is, and there are consequences to, to, to this, uh, for this. Because you probably know that engineers, systems engineers today, they may use, uh, 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 for instance, uh, uh, languages to describe, uh, I think, evaluate performance of my system. And uh, you can build the models that uh, will never be used for, for the implementation. Okay? So you have a separation between you have, you have a design flows that are, that are completely discontinuous. Okay? You have chance to the design flows. Why? Because we don't know how to relate the models. And uh, let me show one uh, difficulty here, discuss one difficulty that comes from the use of synchronous components and asynchronous components. So synchronous components are typically hardware components, but with media application. The software we have synchronous components today, and uh, in a synchronous component, so each component we have threads of different colors for different components. So the assumption of synchrony is that that the threads synchronize from time to time, and you have a notion of step. While for synchronous components you don't have a predefined execution step. Okay, so you are using a general purpose programming language or application software, you, you would get synchronization from time to time. And this makes an important uh, uh, difference because uh, here you have an imposed uh, scheduling principle. In fact, in, uh, within a step, you have to schedule all these activities and you have an imposed fairness. While here you have to use uh, uh, systems of priority to do that. And the open problem, of course, is how to consistently compose synchronous and asynchronous components. We have probably about GALS. GALS uh, means the global asynchronous local synchronous system. Another source of heterogeneity systems is that, that you have uh, uh, different ways to compose to organize interaction. You may have interaction, for instance, by rendezvous or interaction by broadcast. And uh, you know probably languages, for instance, when you are programming, uh, function call is interaction by rendezvous. And uh, if you have, say, an antenna uh, in a sense of you have interaction by broadcast. And 
uh, very often languages often offer support only this or the other mechanism. <laughs> and if you want to have a language that supports both or combine both, you need, you need some theory in order to do that very good and this theory does not exist. Now let me say a few words about how I understand the problem of component-based design. So this is the problem that are facing engineers every day. You want to build a component C that satisfies a given property P from a set of atomic components C0 and by using what I call glue operator. So an engineer has uh, these boxes, these are atomic components, glues them together to build the uh, compound or composite components, and uh, he plays this game until he gets a component that meet, meets the property of the requirements, the initial requirements. So this is a hard problem, I don't know how to solve it, uh, but at least I would like to have a framework to talk about that. And uh, I think that the key concept here is the concept of glue operator. So the glue operator is uh, the uh, operator that takes these arguments, atomic components that are characterized by their behavior and gives more complex behavior. Now, if I look at existing theories today for composing components, you will see that we, for instance, when we are programming, the glue is a function call, or we have some theories that are based on uh, the composition of and things like that. And this is low level. I would like to have two operators that are coordination mechanisms such as protocols, schedulers, and passes. And I need, I need theory for that. And uh, also, I would like, when I use component, to be able to reason about the correctness of what I'm doing. And for this, I need two types of rules. One is what I call compositionality rules. So the compositionality rules allow when I have components that are healthy, so I have uh, components that are available, that are certified, correct. So for instance, they are, I know that these two components are develop free. If I do them together and they produce uh, a composite component that they, they enjoy, they satisfy the same, the same property, for instance, that they are I, I need the results for this. And I thought, okay, you can try to formalize this, I'm not going to comment, but uh, today we don't have compositionality results for the preservation of the component. And uh, we apply only uh, verification techniques uh, with uh, well-known uh, limitations. I'm not going to comment this. Now, I said that when you uh, Build a system out of components, you should have compositionality rules, but this is not enough because you need also what I call the composability rules. So let me try to explain this. So, when I build, uh, say, a wall from uh, bricks, the theory, compositionality theory, will say that if the bricks satisfy a certain type of properties, then I can build a, a, a wall that will not collapse. Composability would say that the wall should not be too high. So when I integrate my bricks in the wall, they should not, basic properties will not be jeopardized. So that's what I recommend that. But let me give an example, because this is a, a very, very important requirement. Uh, in, uh, for component-based design. So I am an engineer, and uh, okay, I, I suppose that the yellow boxes here are tasks, and by putting together some tasks, I know how to solve a mutual student problem. So I have some theory that says by adding this type of group, mutual student. Okay, good. I have the same set of tasks, and uh, I this group group prime. Uh, enforces a property that is scheduled. Now, what is the obvious question? Whether I can have a system where I have integrated this, the same set of components, the same the tasks, and I have uh, both neutral excision and scheduled. And uh, the way I can do that is not obvious. I mean, we have no theory for doing this. 
This means that we will superpose the two types of group, or we will compose them. And you probably know that when I'm trying to do that, we will get interference of solutions, interference of design. So engineers know how to solve uh, individual problems. We have no theory for combining them. Okay, so you learn a lot of algorithms, you know uh, of architectures, but you don't know how to combine them. And this has to, to do with uh, the stability of properties when you superpose solutions. And there are uh, many problems in systems engineering due to lack of composability. For instance, you know that the scheduling app are do not compose. Web services do not compose because of interference of features. Okay. And uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is a hard problem. I don't know how to solve. Now, the third problem is uh, what I call adaptivity. I don't know how much time I have to explain this. This is the most important challenge. I'm talking about adaptivity because I don't want to talk about intelligence. Uh, remember, 20 years ago, uh, there was on the basic artificial intelligence, they had a lot of money, and uh, okay, the vision was very strong, and this proved to be not so realistic, no common. So, I would like to talk about, instead of intelligence, talk about adaptivity, and this is a more, more modest vision about intelligence. Uh, this means that the system's behavior adapts so as to meet given requirements in the presence of uncertainty in its external or execution environment. So the correctness is enforced by using control-based techniques, and I'd like to take some time to explain this, why we need adaptive systems. So the reason we need the adaptive systems is uh, uh, because uh, the environment of our systems are uncertain. It's impossible to predict statically a design time the behavior of the system. Okay, so we have to uh, design it uh, uh, to adapt to changing environment. To changing environment. So what are possible sources of uncertainty? Of course, the physical environment uh, is not maybe non deterministic you should understand. But also the execution platforms uh, uh, are more uh, non-deterministic behavior and here I'm giving some factors for this. We have parallel execution time due to layering, caches, speculative execution. Hardware is becoming very, very sophisticated and unpredictable. So this issue of uh, Uncertainty is related to lack of predictability. Uh, for predictability, I can give us some formal definition, but okay, hope you understand this. And uh, you understand also that, that uncertainty uh, makes the behavior of system uh, less predictable. So we have a lack of predictability due to uncertainty, this you understand. But there is also another reason for which you have non-predictability, lack of predictability. And this is due to the fact that in, in computer science, it's impossible to make an exact analysis due to non-computability of, 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 of some functions that, that are involved in system analysis. And let me try to explain this by an example. So if I am, an engineer, for instance, in uh, 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 real-time systems, I'm interested in execution time, so very simple statements. Okay? And uh, I need estimates of best case execution time, but maybe the worst case execution time, if I'm interested in, 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 in uh, respecting some deadlines. Now, if, if I try to do to apply some theoretical method to estimate this. In fact, what I can compute is not exactly this. I can compute some other approximation of this. And the difference between the, these two can be significant. So the result is that very often when I, I, I do some 
I want to design a system that respects the rights, and I want to make the behavior predictable. I have to pay a lot in resources. Very often, critical systems are overdimensioned. And I said in the beginning of, the, of my talk that we have today two approaches in systems engineering. We have critical systems engineering and best effort engineering. And, and uh, these approaches are, are very different. If I am a critical systems engineer, my main concern is how to keep the state of my system within a region that, OK, in, in this region. Not so how to enforce uh, uh, that behavior to remain in good state, not to reach bad state, because bad states are catastrophic. If I am a best effort engineer, the problem is how to keep my, let's say, my system at, uh, okay, to, to reach some optimum or have some optimum, even at the risk of reaching error states. But I know that I can recover from these error states, and this is not catastrophic. And this, uh, this, this leads to very different design principles. And uh, today, uh, we have this separation between critical and best effort engineering. Uh, uh, and this, this, uh, 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 this has some impact. <coughs> in a development course. For instance, in cars industry, five years ago, something like that, uh, car uh, uh, industrialists have been building, OK, you know that today in a car, we have, uh, in a modern car, we have more than 80 electronic control units. So each electronic control unit is, OK, tested, works perhaps perfectly, and they design separately critical and non-critical. The problem is that if you want now to have what they call a federated architecture to interconnect them, the reliability of the interconnect is, is very, very weak, and the overall result may be catastrophic. So uh, the idea is that we cannot continue with this schizophrenic situation, separate critical and best effort, and there are different solutions for this. One is to enhance predictability by making our system more, more determinist. And uh, I'm not going to comment on this, but I don't like, I don't think that this is really realistic to see the solutions that are stated here. And another way to uh, cope with this is uh, to have uh, adaptive control mix. And that's, that's the approach I prefer. So here the idea is that we will have systems where we will integrate both critical and best effort features. And the problem will be, okay, how to okay to serve, so to use a, a global amount of resource, uh, resources uh, to satisfy critical properties, to meet critical properties in priority. And then to make for the rest of the resources some optimal use. So if I push this idea to the very extreme, this means, for instance, that in an aircraft you don't you have a, a set of resources for uh, infotainment and for control. And uh, if for control you need more resources, you just stop infotainment. Okay, this is a, an idea that is very dangerous. Huh? and that kind of engineers will never apply, but this is the idea pushed to the extreme. And uh, we apply these <coughs> ideas of adaptive control, but I fear I'm running out of time. I'm not going to, I have time. Okay, so let me explain what, what, how we apply these ideas of adaptive control and what adaptive control is. Because adaptive control is a concept that comes from control theory, but here, uh, uh, Okay, this, this is the, 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 the way I understand the context, uh, the, the concept in the context of, 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 of discrete system. So, uh, an, adapt, an adaptive uh, uh, control system is a system with an adaptive controller, and the controller, in fact, combines uh, three functions, three features. The central one, one is a uh, management of objectives. 
So here I'm considering an application. This is, a, a, this is a, an example from the real project with, uh, with a company called uh, ST Microelectronics. Uh, they were producing uh, MPEG encoders, or using MPEG encoders, <coughs> so this is the system. And an MPEG encoder is a cycling program uh, that, uh, okay, uh, uses this function, so the nodes are functions, and for the function you know the deadline and the execution time that is parameterized by a quality parameter Q. In, uh, in, in the uh, case study, we, uh, we, uh, the Q was taken by this from 0 to 7, a different style. Okay, so this is uh, the model of my program that is cycling. So here, you can find schedules. So you can find the schedules that meet the the planning constraints, and of course the execution plans depend on, on, on the quality. So here you can choose the schedule and the quality. Now the the adaptive controller monitors the execution time. Here it has uh, so the um, the Objective manager has to find the schedule and maximize the quality of Mr. Clark. And here it uses uh, this planning uh, uh, function. And also it has a solar loop where here, because uh, this, this model uses, uh, in fact, execution types that are characterized by uh, uh, worst case execution types and double execution types. And this cannot be estimated exactly, you will use this level of function. Okay, so uh, an adaptive controller works more or less as our mind box to solve a problem. So at some stage of your mind, you will say, okay, these are my possible objectives for tonight. Okay, go to the stadium, uh, go to a movie or a restaurant. You pick one objective by applying some criteria, so here you have a model of your external world and, and the priorities you have, and you say, okay, let, let's pick up this, you make the choice, and once you make the choice, you evaluate your choice, okay? So you adapt, so here you learn something, and here you will modify some parameters, if you want to okay? And this is exactly the, 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 the principle. Uh, adaptive systems they use, and uh, we have some, for this project, we have some very interesting experimental results. I'm not going to comment this. I would like to say that adaptive control is used in many areas today in, in computer science, data mining systems, in networks, okay? And this is, we needed to, we needed to develop architectures and principles for adaptive control and, and for enforcing that. Okay, we finish. Uh, uh, with the discussion about computer science and how I see the evolution of computer science. The first point that I have commented already, and uh, I think that the focus should be on system design. This is central to the discipline as I see its evolution today. And uh, this I, I have commented already. I think that computer science complements and enriches our knowledge with theory and models that allow a deeper understanding of discrete dynamic system. This is true. And uh, if I compare computer science to physics, it proposes a constructive and operational view of the world. This is also true. And the reason I show this slide is because uh, you can imagine I'm giving lectures, a lot of lectures in the world. And I, I, have, uh, I was surprised to the discussion with people that consider that, for instance, computer science is just a branch of mathematics. Uh, computer science is a discipline uh, uh, on its own right, uh, with its own uh, 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 paradigms, its own concepts. I hope you understand this. So I think these are three basic disciplines, and uh, mathematics has, is a logical standing behind, uh, providing all the tools. I hope there is no confusion about that. I think it's interesting to attempt a comparison between physics and computer science for many reasons. 
Uh, I think there are important differences because uh, physics uh, deals with the phenomena of a real physical world, so this something is given, and the computer science uh, uh, deals with uh, artifacts, okay? Focuses mainly on the construction of systems. And one important question is whether we build the systems that are good enough or okay, whatever. And uh, for physical systems, we have an uh, analytical model to understand. So here the approach is more declarative. And uh, here we have a more constructive approach based on discrete mathematics, with, uh, based on continuous mathematics. And we, I hope you understand the differences. One important difference is that here you can be predictor, at least in classic uh, physics, and here you are using a lot of verification to establish correctness. Uh, the other, so let's say a few words uh, on the relation between artificial and natural intelligence. You know that living organs uh, combine physical and computational phenomena in some very intricate and uh, intimate manner, okay? And uh, I think it's important to understand the differences here. There are some shared characteristics, this is obvious what I'm saying here, but also some remarkable differences. Computation in, uh, in uh, living organs is, is much more robust, and we have different clean backends for adaptivity and things like that. I think that we will never reach the gap between uh, these. I think the basic models here are very, very different from natural. And uh, we will never have the robustness of the computation of, of, of natural uh, intelligence. And uh, finally, there are possible constructivizations. I'm mentioning here too. You know that now for intent uh, biology, uh, CAD methods and tools are becoming important. And also we can learn by studying models from the computer and things like that. Okay, let me finish by saying a few words about uh, research in computer science. Uh, uh, I hope you understand what there are many different attitudes. You have knights fighting dragons or fighting windmills. Uh, some people playing in, in the uh, uh, sandbox here, some collective effort, a lot of discussion. Okay, so what happens in research? Okay, you have uh, this is uh, quite often, and I don't think that the research in computer science is. Uh, and is differs from other disciplines in that respect. Very often in computer science we've been uh, uh, over optimistic about the results of some approaches. And I think we should be honest enough to admit this. And uh, another problem in uh, research is uh, the what I call the nice theory syndrome. This is something I would like to discuss. What's the role of theory in any field? It's to make models that accurately describe the world, and, and these models also should be useful to engineers uh, uh, so that they can do better than their job. And as I said, uh, that today the current scope and for focus of research in computer science does not address, in my opinion, the basic problems raised by system design and engineering. Now, an important question for that, that I, I, I think we should address as, as computer science is the following. I think that very often people work with nice theory that is not always practical and relevant. We have a lot of people that have been producing longer theory in computer science. And on the other hand, here we have a people who work on, uh, you have the gap of the upper standards. For instance, you have people that uh, propose standards, and uh, if I consider something like QML, for instance, it's impossible to formalize and, and to 
three theoretically. So you should find the right the balance. So on the one hand, you have people who are interested in this nice theory that is not always practically relevant. And here I like this citation this, uh, is, uh, for, from uh, Paul Kruger, who is a Nobel uh, uh, Prize in, in uh, economics. And of course, for the opposite attitude, who, okay, we should try something to find some balance. And, and this is a very, very important question for computer science. So, is it possible to find a mathematically elegant and still a practical theoretical framework for computer science? This is a question to which I don't have an answer for the moment. I think that. We will never have a nice theory as we have in physics, uh, for sure, classical physics. Because, because uh, here we model a world that is a product of an evolution. Somehow, I, I don't want to comment more on this. Oh, computer science deals with building an artifact, and here the key issue is contractivity. So, not how to describe and explain, but how to construct. And uh, the problem will be how to build the cost effective correct system. And the, should, the focus should be on this. Uh, perhaps we have only recipes. We don't have the nice analytical models and the nice analytical approach. But this is, this is the natural of, of, of systems we are starting. And I'm going to finish my presentation by talking about teaching computer science and give some, some, some uh, my point of view about that. Uh, okay, a very implicit to other facts. Think in terms of systems, this is very, very important. And I think it's important also to keep the students aware of limitations of existing theory of computing. Very often students do not understand this. They consider that uh, Theory is really the panacea. And here, of course, the two classics from control theory and electrical engineering. Also, this, to put emphasis on information computation as universal concepts that are not applicable only to computers. And, of course, the last one is, is obvious provide the background for trivial critical thinking. This is very, very important. And I think I, I stop here. I would thank you. And I would like to say that on my web page there is a paper that uh, uh, I, uh, okay, is, uh, has the same title as my talk. So if you want to, 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 to read the paper, uh, okay. I, and send me also feedback. I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. 
flow of sound. Okay, that's the message. Any other question? How big of a problem is the time you know, between uh, the beginning of the board and the visual? You gave an example where you have this uh, step. Yes. Okay, so. Where are we in terms of uh, coming out with some understanding of this the semantics of time and the fact that the whole system that they come from is for them? Okay, so. How close are we? So, if. Because I can do make some strong synchronization. If you have a long and tight basis, so it's in there, right? Yes. If I take a synchronous equivalent of something, yes. and I take a synchronous event again, I can go with something now, if I sound like a tail, then I can verify everything at the very fine, fine sounding, but I don't have yes. a stupid way of doing it. Yes. Is there a better? Uh, I cannot say. I mean, it's. But, 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 uh, but the deep. If, if you have a global measure of time, you will need some form of synchronization somehow. And, and uh, okay, this is very different from a completely asynchronous model, okay? Where you don't have uh, this, uh, uh, this, you don't have this uh, notion of time step, okay? And this is an important difference. If you don't have strong synchronization primitives, you, you cannot achieve the, 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 the synchronization. Is it obvious or is it obvious or is it Because you have many components that they are synchronous and many components that are synchronous. Mm -hmm. You get many systems that have to operate together. So is there an idea about how we do that? Can we relax? Mm -hmm. they, they, they can they relax some, some uh, but you don't have theory about it. Uh, there are there are some there, there are some approaches yes about how, how to do that and also it depends on the properties you want to preserve okay, the degree of precision. Okay. Other question. Other question. Yes. Uh, we said the Some results from 
uh, the theory of distributed computing. Okay, the idea, the concept of architecture. I have a, a, a set of components that enjoy some properties. How I can coordinate the behavior to achieve some local property? Okay, and there are some results about that, and we should work. Okay, all we need is recipes. Okay, that's this is a concept theory. But we cannot have a very, very general theory that something can be played for any kind of property. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How do you feel that uh, the difference between computer science and electric or computer engineering is going to like, be in the future? Or Sorry, what's the question? The How difference between computer, or computer engineering and computer science is going to be? Okay, it depends on what you mean by computer science and computer engineering. So if computer engineering is hardware engineering. Okay, so this for me should be a part of computer science and of a discipline that will uh, encompass not only what we traditionally call computer science, it should include control, I mean encompass control, signal processing, all call, call telecommunications of this. I mean, we need a unified discipline that talks about I mean, studies, phenomena. You see, physics is the discipline that deals with transformations of matter and energy. Or whatever. Okay? And this is physics. And uh, we need a discipline, call it as you like, that deals with the phenomena of transformation of and transmission of information. Okay? And transformation of information is computation. Okay? And we need a discipline like that. So, um, what are your thoughts on co-design? You know, when you're simultaneously designing yes. the complicated system. Yes, okay, so co-design yeah. co has been a buzzword that has, has been very fashionable uh, some years ago, and now it's less fashionable. So the idea was that we, I will start, I will want to design a system, and then I will have some theory that will allow me to decide which part of the system I will implement by hardware and the other by software. So, of course, the idea is very attractive. The problem is that today we don't have a theory to understand. So, even if I understand perfectly what my software does and what my hardware does, I, don't, I cannot understand the behavior of my software running on the hardware as the composition of two models. Uh, so the most, these compositions have been mixtures of hardware and software? Or just software, software, hardware, hardware? Okay, so I would like to have a theory, but I don't have it for the moment. I have a model of my software, a model of my hardware, and now I compose them, and I, I know what will be the the, 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 all the behavior of the system, the results. And, and, and this, perhaps you can do that for very simple systems, but if you have a platform with operating systems, I mean, this means that you know how to model operating systems, uh, on, on the features of, of operating systems, memory management systems, drivers, okay? So you don't know how to do that for, for real systems. So the idea, of uh, co-design, uh, uh, I mean, was conceptually is it's an, in, an interesting one, but in practice, uh, uh, I mean, it's failed to, 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 to provide any concrete result. What I believe is that today, uh, the state of the art, what we should try to do is for a given hardware platform, how we can implement efficiently. So to fix one parameter of the design, that is a hardware platform, so you choose some hardware platform, and you try to find optimal implementation of, of some software for a given hardware platform. This is already a very hard problem. Okay, let's thank Professor Spikes again. <laughs> for those of you who want to do the discussion, tomorrow, 10 to 12, we will have a, a traditional roundtable discussion in 11.46 every minute. Thank you.